Hi, welcome to the Dr. Milton Social Work Show. Tonight's episode is about dealing with the stages of grief and loss. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to share some of the stories about my journey through grief and loss with the passing of my mother, who passed away on January 31st, 2019, from Alzheimer's. I'm an only child. I was her, her caretaker, and I'm going to give examples of this process by sharing my own story. And that way you can get to know me a little more as I'm new on your airwaves. Enjoy the PowerPoint. So there are five stages of grief that are typically accepted um, with sort of uniform acceptance across various psychology, clinical worlds. And so those five stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I'd like to walk you through all of them and I'll relay stories about each based on my experiences with loss in my own life. The most recent being the loss of my mother. <clears throat> so the first stage of grief is denial. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a refusal to believe that death will occur. Now, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in, in, in the later stages. And so I guess the doctor kind of said to us, you know, she's in the middle stages. That stage could last a long time. It could last a year or two. When you consult the literature about Alzheimer's, uh, particularly early onset, uh, with other sort of mitigating factors, like my mother had uh, a stroke, my mother had diabetes. Um, she had um, a pacemaker defibrillator, so she had heart issues. So you add some of those things in, which exacerbate actually uh, the Alzheimer's because um, there's new research about uh, cardiovascular health and Alzheimer's. But some of that literature seemed to suggest that there was sort of a 10 year window from beginning to end. And that kind of scared me because we were basically in the sixth year or the fifth year at the time that uh, mom was diagnosed. So like, you don't want to believe that. You don't want to believe that this healthy, robust person who, yeah, was having some memory issues here and there and losing things or getting lost, that this whole vibrant person in five years time could be dead. I mean, you just couldn't fathom it. So I didn't believe that she could die from Alzheimer's. Absolutely not. But I'm going to tell you, it basically was 10 years to the day that my mother died and succumbed from her Alzheimer's. Now, um, look, it was a hard thing. Like, I had lots of people to talk to me about it. Um, and I have certainly talked with other people who've experienced losses or the potential for the loss of uh, particularly parents. I'm in that generation where many of our, you know, my peers are losing their parents. Um, and you know, I can be helpful to others just as others have been helpful to me by being available to talk about it. Um, like I couldn't like go into a cocoon about it. Like I couldn't create an alternative universe of facts about it. I really literally had to have the denial bursted by facts and by other people's lived experience. And, um, that was one of the ways I was sort of able to pierce through the denial, um, about my mother's, um, prognosis. 
But once you get through denial, well, you move into stage two, which is anger. So once you accept the diagnosis as true, then angry and hostile feelings can take over. And I remember feeling that, like, Jesus, you know, why didn't she catch a break? I mean, she's been through so much in her life, you know? Um, like, you know, these are this is the time of her life. She should just be relaxing and enjoying, you know, bowling and playing cards and having fun and socializing and taking trips with her only daughter, me. And I just remember being incredibly angry. And yes, I turned some of that anger toward God because I thought, my goodness, you know, like, how could you do this to her, God? Like, she's not going to see the book we're writing together come to fruition. She's not going to continue to see her nieces and nephews grow up. She's not going to uh, enjoy uh, uh, watching other family members uh, and engaging with other family members, which gives her so much joy. I remember being mad at God about that. Um, and then I remember being angry at her doctors. And I wanted a second opinion. And I wanted to make sure this was Alzheimer's we were dealing with. So I set about the task to do that. And I got mad at the family, too, about, like, you know, leaving her alone and not having her properly stimulated. And, um, you know, she was in isolation a lot of the times. But I've come to understand that that's the way she liked it. But I felt like, you know, we have so much stress in our family and we're not like, if you can say this anymore, the Cosby family, like close and cohesive and warm. We, we, we had occasions where we were that. Uh, but mostly everybody's in their own lives, living independently. And her family's in Texas and, and, and Philly and other places. And we were in South Jersey. And, you know, it, it wasn't easy for family members to rally around and be around all the time and give support to their uh, the eldest daughter in the family. Um, and then at a sort of certain point, I realized that I couldn't take this personally, okay? Like this was just the way it was. It was a diagnosis. Uh, you know, I myself have a significant health problem. Uh, I think I went through some of these same stages. Uh, with my own medical problems. Um, but, you know, at a certain point, I said, you know, don't take it personally, Barbara. I mean, um, you know, uh, and people didn't take it personally from me. They understood I had a right to be angry, so they allowed me to express myself so I could keep moving on, you know. So mommy was angry when she got that Alzheimer's diagnosis. I mean, it really pissed her off. And for a period there, until she, you know, got to what we now know are some of the other stages. Um, and people get it, you know. If you have a major life-threatening disorder, uh, you're going to have emotions about it. So then the next stage you go into is bargaining. This is like the dying person who may start to negotiate with God and say things like, I'll live a healthier life. I'll be nicer. I'll be a nicer person. I was angry, so let me ask nicely, God, please let me live. Um, they might negotiate with the doctors by saying, how can I get more time so I can live in my dream home, and so on. And there's a deep sense of yearning at this stage to be well again. And um, I know, um, you know, Alzheimer's is, you know, with cognitive decline, some of that sort of self-talk and some of that sort of uh, reflection and negotiating skills and things like that is uh, diminished. But I certainly know that there was a point where my mom said, oh, if I just ate better, you know, I'm really going to give up the, uh, you know, the chicken, the fried chicken now. I'm going to give up, uh, you know, I'm never going to drink again. I mean, you know, I, I want to beat this. You know, I'm going to do crossword puzzles every day. And, um, and you know, and I know God's going to bless me and let me have a longer life. And I'm going to beat this, you know. And um, I know it, with every part of her being, she wanted that to be so. 
Um, so there, you know, I did observe her really at a certain point in the beginning wanting to, you know, to live and live longer and to live the life she used to have. Well, then you move into sort of further into the acceptance of the group process and you get uh, experienced depression. This is when reality sets in about the near death. Your bargaining turns to depression. It's the fear of the unknown. It's guilt for demanding so much attention and, you know, depleting family resources. Um, uh, so I remember this very clearly when we sort of turned that corner. And, and mommy's affect really changed. I mean, she, she cried a lot, actually, in this phase. And she started saying things like, it'll be sad that I won't see anybody anymore. It'll be sad that, um, you know, that God might take me. Um, and she would ask questions about, um, uh, you know, what's on the other side. You know, if there's a God and if there's a heaven and what that would be like. And, you know, I don't want to be in pain, she used to say. I really don't want to be in pain. I don't want to be in pain. Don't let them hurt me. If I got to go meet my maker, don't let them hurt me. Um, and I remember also mom making specific statements that were guilt ridden guilt it you know rooted in guilt because of all the caretaking from me and other family members and that did include expenditures of money like paying for carers and caregivers and you know repairs in her home and all kinds of things and like really and she didn't have much money um you know not at all she was on social security had a small modest pension so there was a lot of statements of like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that you have to spend your time taking care of me. You should be living your life. You should be taking care of yourself. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I know you were kicking out a lot of extra money for me. And, uh, you know, just feeling guilty about it. Um, and I did try to take a stance with mommy around uh, being available to listen to her and, you um, you know, I wasn't trying to like cheer her up per se. I just listened and I encouraged other people to listen to her. And I, you know, I know she was repeating herself over and over because that was the condition that she had. But, you know, I thought it was very important to demonstrate patience and empathy um, and to, you know, let her know it was kind of normal to be feeling the way she was feeling. I mean, this is a little more than grief. This is like loss, like mommy was going to be passing away, you know, and these are the things I was seeing. Um, and I remember sometimes when she would be sad when we were in that stage, I would, I would sometimes purposely try to shift the mood, like I play music. Um, I would talk to her about sports. Um, you know, she loved her Eagles football team. She actually liked anybody but the Dallas Cowboys. Um, and she uh, liked tennis and Serena Williams. And she liked uh, baseball. You name it, she liked the sport. So distracting her with sports or gospel music or um, engaging her in a game of some sort, especially when she could handle it cards and later it became... Uh, a very simple card game like playing war. Um, I would do some of that, but I would always take care that I didn't do it where it was a substitute for listening to her or a substitute or from um, not talking about the serious nature of the problem that was in front of us. Uh, it was trying to balance those two things out. Um, and also I want to say, you know, she was in the care of a long-term care facility and she had access to counseling and psychiatric care. And, you know, there was a period of time she was in that anxious, depressed state for a while. In fact, you know, even at the beginning she was very anxious. Um, and they recommended a course of some medication for mommy and when she got that, it made a big difference. Like you can sort of see like what was the depression that was sort of reality based, like knowing you're going to pass away at some point from a major life threatening condition, health 
health concern versus like clinical depression, you know. And I thought when she got the medication, it really helped her out tremendously. Then you sort of get to this fifth stage, which is about acceptance. <sighs> when the dying have enough time and support, they can often move into acceptance. There's an inner peace about the upcoming death. The dying person will want someone caring and accepting by their side. And I have to say, when we entered that phase, it was beautiful. And we did have tremendous support. She had 24-7 care with competent and caring professionals around the clock. She um, had my company and my wife's company and friends visiting her and family would be calling in and some friends made it up from South Jersey to the long-term care facility she was in in North Jersey with me. Um, she had support. That fear of what is the next thing that's going to happen, you could see it dissipating. You could see the inner peace coming. And she would say, she would say often, you know, I made my peace with God. I made my peace with God. It was at this time I just started discussing with my mother her will, her funeral, all kinds of aspects of her, um, what we call in the black community, her going home service, you know, and the repast afterwards, you know. I mean, making decisions about, you know, the coffin she wanted, the people she wanted at the service, the place she wanted to be buried at close to me, the who she wanted speaking at her funeral, what she wanted written in her obituary, um, all those kinds of things. What she, she wanted, what she wanted to eat, or for her guests to eat at the repast. So she made her peace with it. And she did say to me, the only thing I want is not to be alone. And she was not alone. She was never alone. If I wasn't there, if my wife wasn't there, if, I mean, she had 24-7 care. There was always someone with her. Someone caring, someone accepting, someone professional, someone uh, who stood in my stay until I got there and I was there quite often. So that acceptance piece was beautiful. It was just beautiful. So in summary, I want you to know like the stages don't always occur in order. That's a misnomer to think that they do. Sometimes you go in and out. Sometimes you're bargaining, and then you go into acceptance, and then you, or you might be in the anger stage, and then you'll go into the depression stage, or vice versa. Um, you could have acceptance from the beginning, and then you know, sort of the layers of the onion are peeled back and then, oh, you get, now you're getting to the feelings under that acceptance. Um, so understand this is a human emotion. This is uh, whether you're the patient, whether you're the person, whether you're the loved one. I mean, nobody escapes the grief process. Grief is universal and it it's an ex a human experience and it's rippling effects from the identified person to the per people in that inner circle, the children, the, s the siblings, uh, and then broaden it out to your, your friends and other, other uh, what we call uh, uh, victim kin um, in our culture. Um, these are like not blood relations, but essentially family members. And then you, you blow that out more to like the community, you were involved in your churches, your, your bowling teams, etc. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we all experience the grief and we, all of the circles of support are activated when we know someone's close to uh, passing and, lo and losing them. Now people grieve at different rates of time. Um, delayed grief can occur when people suppress emotions of death and years later they can get depressed. Um, you know, um, 
I think there are, as it says, cultural differences, age, gender, race, personality changes, uh, the way people grieve as well. Um, and I think that's um, borne out in the literature and it's very true. And I just know, um, you know, it takes the time that it takes. It takes the time that it takes. And you go through these stages, sometimes not in order, and you can be in them for as long as you're in them until you psychologically, emotionally, and behaviorally cope with it. So there's no such thing as, oh, you'll get over it and, you know, it takes a month to get over the passing of someone or the, the, takes, you know, two weeks to get over hearing bad news about a diagnosis or something like that. Uh, it takes the time that it takes. And, you know, uh, there are variables. Um, certainly, you know, when it's like an infant, you know, or a young child that uh, we're grieving over, that's like, oh my God, that child's hardly lived their life. Um, and that could impact the way that you grieve about that young person. Oh my God, they, she was only five. Versus when someone lived to be like 85 and 90 and they lived a long life and you would grieve differently because it's sort of like that's the circle of life. Like when my grandmother passed in her late 80s, you were just like, even though we wanted her around more, and I think there are things grandmom could have done to like elongate her life, but she made her peace with passing. And, you know, she had 11 kids. She lived her life. She was a stalwart Christian. She was a generous and kind person. Uh, who helped so many people because she was literate, like she could read and write, and so many in my grandmother's generation did not learn how to read and write. And you know, you hear all these stories after she passed away, how she would read people's letters in the senior building she was in, or write letters for people. She had beautiful cursive handwriting. Um, but you know, a person who lives a full life like that, even though you know, admittedly, there was a time when grandma would say. Uh, oh, she'd want to see her daughters, you know, her grandchildren um, growing up. She would like to make wedding dresses for some of the granddaughters that she had, you know, um, and great-grandchildren that she had. So she had a momentary sense of sadness about all of that. But really, she was made her peace with passing. And she... And she... And we understood that, you know, she lived a long life. And, you know, I have to say my mother, again, because of her Christian uh, Christian foundation, also made her peace at a certain, when she got to that place about um, her faith. And she started talking about visions that she was getting of, like, people who had gone before her. Um, her mother, her two brothers... Um, friends of hers that were uh, departed um, and she'd say to me at her bedside you know I saw Brian or I saw Miss Larray or I saw my grandma my mother and uh, I know they're waiting for me on the other side so I'm not fearing it I know that when God takes me I'm going to see them again and it gave her a real sense of peace. Um, and just understand that people that are left behind, like those of us who are grieving and bereaved when someone passes, they are at risk for higher rates of depression and are at greater risk for illnesses than people who aren't in active states of bereavement. And this is important to understand. Um, and so all of those skills around um, talking to people about your feelings, you could do journal writing, you can talk to your sister friends, your best friends, your guy friends, you could talk to your pastors, you can talk to your coaches, teachers if you're young people in school or if you're in college and you're an adult learner, you know, whomever it is you feel like you have some trust and connection to that you can um, reach out to them for support. 
siblings, family members, cousins, that sort of thing. Because you are at higher risk for difficulty uh, than the average person. And because um, there's a depression and sort of this internalization of this grief and sadness that you're experiencing, then there, there is a suppression of your immune system, actually. And it does represent like sort of a stress on you biologically and physiologically so that there is the potentiality for contracting other kinds of illnesses. Like you notice like when people are depressed a lot of times they have colds more often than other people have. They're susceptible to things like that. So just be on the lookout for things like that. All right, really important. And just a sort of quick note on what to do with children um, and how to help children cope with loss. Be straightforward. You know, uh, it's really important. Distortions can do really bad harm. So saying things like, oh, he's gone to sleep. And then, you know, you say, oh, daddy went to sleep. And that could say to a kid, oh, my God, I'm never going to sleep again because if I go to sleep, God's going to take me, right? Or, or God's a bad person, so I'm going to hate, you know, I have a fear and a hatred of God. Like, be straightforward. There are lots of books out there that help you to talk to kids about uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, the ugly parts of life, really. Or, I should say, you know, death is a part of life. But these are the harder parts of life to face. Um, so there are resources out there for you. Um, and make sure they understand that in no way they're to be blamed for the loss of the loved one. All right? Well, allow the child to participate in the sorrow and grief. Going to funerals, going to the uh, services, the viewings, the repass, talking about it, looking, um, you know, giving them a lot of attention. Uh, um, there are kids who cry, there are kids who don't cry. But make sure you're giving to your child um, the attention the child needs. And if you know, try if you think you're protecting them because you don't talk about it, that actually can do worse for them. And for little boys, I hear this so often, don't say you're the man of the house now, be brave. That just teaches little boys not to express their emotions. So you go through the same experiences of losing a person as you do with life events. Like if you get divorced, uh, there's a breakup, you lose a job. All of those same stages come to play. Um, and just understand that uh, drugs deaden your emotions. Drugs are not the answer. Okay? Drugs are not an answer. Turn away from those kind of dangerous deadening things. Because you don't find peace, meaning, value, or purpose in your life if you turn to negative coping. So allow yourself to grieve by looking at pictures, playing nostalgic music, reading old letters. Um, you can use movement as a way to help express your grieving pains, your grief. You can use art, painting, drawing. I know I do a lot of uh, journaling and drawing, and I listen to music, um, uh, things that remind me of my mother. Um, and if you believe in, if you have a religious practice of any kind, whether it's Christian or Buddhist or Hindi or uh, whether it's just uh, nature, you know. Think how would how would they tell you to respond to the sadness? Um, and remember that funerals and ceremonies and rituals are designed by nature to help the person who's grieving. Thank you for listening to this, and I. Hope you got some helpful information. And remember, I'm going to leave some resources at the end for you. I hope that was helpful information about the five stages of grief and loss. And I shared a little bit about some of the unique factors related to children and the similarities between losing a loved one and having a significant change in the status in your life of a life event. I want to say a tool that has been so helpful to me 
um, has been to join support groups. And oftentimes these support groups are in hospitals in your local community. Uh, sometimes they're in uh, mental health clinics. And in the era that we're in of social media, there are many support groups on social media. This is the upside of social media. I'll do episodes in the future about what I consider to be the downsides of social media. But this is an upside of it. In fact, I'm on a group on Facebook that is about people who lose a parent. So people from all over the world are part of that group. I learned so much from these people who share their stories. They give me such hope. They share their experience, their strength, their process, and I get validated each time. I just know I'm never alone. Uh, God bless you all, and I'll look forward to the next time I get to chat with you all.